bless the Maker and his water. Bless the coming and going of him. May his passage cleanse the world and keep the world for his people. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 differences between Dune 1984 and Dune 2021. Father! Father! The sleeper has awakened! So squeeze rather. Squeeze hard. Yes, Uncle. And the vermin. Kill them all. For this list, we're looking at how Denis Villeneuve's adaptation of Frank Herbert's 1965 novel differs from David Lynch's cult film. Keep in mind that there will be spoilers for both movies. But a person needs new experiences. They draw something deep inside, allowing them to grow. Which version of Dune do you prefer? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. We get to see more of Caladan. I'll miss the sea. Since the title is Dune, it makes sense that both of these films would primarily take place on the desert planet Arrakis. However, the first act of Villeneuve's version dedicates more time to the Atreides homeworld Caladan. We are a house Atreides. There is no call we do not answer, there is no faith that we betray. While we get to see glimpses of the oceanic planet in Lynch's film, most of the time on Caladan is spent indoors, while the exterior shots are largely shrouded in darkness. Caladan has more of a presence in Villeneuve's film, with foggy blue skies and green mountaintops. Villeneuve shot these scenes in Stadlandet, Norway, taking us to a locale that's familiar yet otherworldly. The time spent on Caladan creates a greater contrast when House Atreides ventures from their peaceful ocean environment to the unforgiving desert. Number 9. Less voiceover exposition. Where are my feelings? I feel for no one. The second moon. To squeeze more of Herbert's text into the 137 minute runtime, Lynch relied heavily on narration. The 1984 film opens with Princess Irulan talking directly into the camera, explaining what the spice is and where to find it. A beginning is a very delicate time. Know then that it is the year 10,191. The 2021 film commences with a similar monologue, although Zendaya's Chani takes Irulan's place. Our planet Arrakis is so beautiful when the sun is low. Rolling over the sands, you can see spice in the air. Beyond the opening narration, Villeneuve delivers exposition in a more organic fashion. Instead of constantly whispering inner monologues, information is naturally woven into conversations. Whenever the film starts to get exposition heavy, Villeneuve matches the dialogue with something visually interesting, helping the audience to follow the story. Villeneuve shows rather than tells, which makes for more effective world building. Number 8. Sandworms. Russell has called a big one again. It is the legend. Arrakis's giant sandworms are perhaps the most iconic figures in the Dune franchise. Relying on practical effects, Lynch's film featured 15 rather phallic puppets that were filmed inside miniature sets. The largest was 22 feet long. They were designed by Italian special effects artist Carlo Rambaldi, who had also worked on Alien and E.T. the Extraterrestrial. In contrast, Villeneuve's sandworms are CGI, but his team spent a year getting, quote, every little detail of the creatures down, trying to make them as realistic as possible. They ditched the triangular lobes and inner lips added by Rambaldi in favor of a mouth that now more resembles a lamprey's. The worm's teeth are also much longer, making them appear more fearsome than ever. Number 7. A more triumphant exit for Duncan. Duncan! Oh. 
I was just on my way to say goodbye to you. In both films, Swordmaster Duncan Idaho meets his end defending House Atreides. Yet Duncan's death plays out differently in each picture. In Lynch's film, Duncan gets shot in the head during the initial House Atreides attack. The moment flies by quickly, though, and it's hard to even recognize Duncan behind his bizarrely designed defense shield. Villeneuve has Duncan go out in a blaze of glory. Meeting up with Paul and Lady Jessica shortly after their escape, Duncan decides to sacrifice himself to save them. Sealing the door shut, Duncan takes down several enemies before eventually being outnumbered. Duncan's death here not only feels closer to the source material, it's also a far more fitting exit for an actor like Jason Momoa. Number 6. The Tahati Challenge You should welcome my blade. Towards the 2021 film's conclusion, Paul proves himself to the Fremen people by beating Jamis in a ritual duel to the death. While Paul's battle against Jamis was supposed to be in Lynch's film, the scene can only be seen in this special TV edition. He surprised me. It was an accident! In both interpretations, Jamis invokes Amtal rule, and Paul receives a Chris knife from Chani. Lady Jessica also confronts Fremen leader Stilgar in each version, although Villeneuve works in more fight choreography. While the battle didn't make it into the theatrical cut of Lynch's film, it serves as Villeneuve's big climax. It also marks a significant turning point, as Paul Atreides takes a step closer to becoming Paul Muad'Dib. Climb up, rise. <laughs> Number 5. More Diverse Casting there was a notable lack of diversity in the 1984 film, which seemed to imagine the future of the human race as strangely homogenous. Where there was war, Muad'Dib would now bring peace. Where there was hatred, Muad'Dib would bring love. Granted, the books don't delve that deep into skin color, although it is mentioned that Leto Atreides has an olive skin tone. The 2021 film reflects Hollywood's changing landscape with a more diverse cast. This is especially apparent among the Fremen, featuring talents like Zendaya, Javier Bardem, and Babs Alusen Mokum. Of course, House Atreides isn't without diversity either, enlisting Oscar Isaac, Jason Momoa, and Stephen McKinley Henderson. Our plan bears fruit. But it will take time. Yes. It will take time. We didn't even mention Dave Bautista, Sharon Duncan Brewster, and Chung Chen. While the protagonist is once again played by a white actor, nobody can deny that Timothy Chalamet embodies the role, leading an all-around progressive ensemble. My road leads into the desert. Number 4. The Baron's Portrayal Actors Kenneth McMillan and Stellan Skarsgård both portray Baron Vladimir Harkonnen as grotesque and villainous, but take very different approaches. He who controls the spice controls the universe. And what Pyta did not tell you is we have control of someone who is very close, very close to Duke Leo. While McMillan's over-the-top performance can be fun, it's hard to take him that seriously. Like, he looks like a cross between Freak Show from Harold and Kumar and Inspector Clouseau's Quasimodo disguise. Meanwhile, Skarsgård's Baron has echoes of Marlon Brando's Kurtz in Apocalypse Now or an unmasked Darth Vader. Did they tell you? He's frail and overweight, but still intimidating, dignified, and calculating. Skarsgård's Baron possesses a booming voice, but he gets just as much across with his deep eyes. Even his anti-gravity devices, which came off as pretty silly in Lynch's film, have a chilling effect here. My desert. My Arrakis. I do. Villeneuve sought to give the Baron, quote, a bit more dimension, and we think he succeeded. Number 3. Stronger Female Characters from Virginia Matson to Linda Hunt to Sean Young, Lynch's Dune certainly had some capable actresses. Tell me of your homeworld, Uso. The film didn't always give its female characters much to do, however. Villeneuve told co-writer Eric Roth that he wanted to focus more on the women. 
finding Lady Jessica especially, quote, fascinating. Played by Rebecca Ferguson here, Jessica is practically a co-lead and even gets to partake in physical combat this time around. I must warn you, whatever you're hiding, it won't be enough. Dr. Kynes was male in the book and portrayed by Max von Sydow in the 1984 film. According to Sharon Duncan Brewster, Villeneuve, quote, wanted to write the role for a woman, casting her. I serve only one master. His name is Shai Halud. We imagine Chani will be more prominent if a sequel moves forward. But even during her limited screen time, Zendaya leaves a powerful impression. It's made from a tooth of Shai Halud, the great sandworm. This will be a great honor for you to die holding it. Number two, the weirding modules. Yell at it. Break! <laughs> Lynch made a lot of odd additions to his adaptation, although the weirding modules are perhaps the most eyebrow-raising. These sonic beam devices essentially turn sound into a weapon. <laughs> This is part of the weirding way that we will teach you. Although weirding modules were not in the book, they derive from the weirding way, a form of Bene Gesserit martial arts. So why did Lynch make this change? Apparently because he wasn't interested in seeing, quote, kung fu on sand dunes. More deep. Villeneuve wisely ditches the sound guns, putting the focus back on close-range combat. Paul spends much of the film learning about the weirding way, and assuming that a sequel gets the green light, we expect he'll pass everything he knows on to the Fremen. Before we unveil our number one pick, here are some honorable mentions. Gurney's Balisset Gone. Are we the only ones that wanted Josh Brolin to get a solo? Give us a song instead. No pugs allowed. And where's the cat milking for that matter? By milking this, this smooth little cat's body, you receive your antidote. Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV and Princess Irulan neither appear in Dune 2021, and Shaddam's master plan isn't revealed right at the start. Then, at an appointed time, Baron Harkonnen will return to Arrakis and launch a sneak attack on House Atreides. I have promised the Baron five legions of my Sardaukar terror troops. Fade Ratha. The treacherous nephew has yet to be introduced in Villeneuve's adaptation. Fade. Paul's vision. As in the book, Timothy Chalamet's Paul has a vision of a bloody interplanetary war. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, it's only half of the first book. Desert power. This is only the beginning. If Lynch proved anything with Dune, it's that the source material can't be covered in just over two hours. You either need an epic runtime or a sequel. Paul's sister Alia matured at a frightening rate. Her small body harbored tremendous powers. Paul and Chani's love grew. Vilnev knew this when he signed on, stating, quote, I would not agree to make this adaptation of the book with one single movie. While a sequel hasn't been officially greenlit yet, the filmmakers approached Dune Part 1 with Dune Part 2 in mind. Villeneuve's movie ends as Paul and Jessica ally with the Fremen. While that happened more than halfway into Lynch's film, this leaves more room for a potential sequel to explore Paul's relationship with the Fremen and his destiny. I can see it. If you'll have us, we will come. And since there are more books in Herbert's saga, this may indeed only be the beginning. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.